How did you survive the Spanish flu? 1918 to 1920. There you lay in your hospital bed, bitter that you hadn't been able to get over to Europe in time to join the last big push against Imperial Germany that would finally end World War I. You had attempted to join the U.S. Army a few months before in mid-1918 at the age of 16 years old, but was turned down to being too young and not having parental consent. Not one to be deterred using a forged birth certificate and a forged father's signature on the parental consent form, you managed to get into a Red Cross military detachment as an ambulance driver. But then you feel your luck changes for the worse as you go down with what seems like a particularly nasty strain of seasonal flu that's going around and you end up being hospitalized for a few weeks. Crucially, this delays you being shipped out to the front line in faraway France, so when you finally get there by ship transporter, the war has been over for a month. You'd think you would be safe now, as you don't become one of the 116,516 Americans killed in the brutal fighting that was the First World War, but unknown to you, a different kind of horror is awaiting you in France. For this year's flu strain that it suggested originated in China earlier in the year has spread across America, mutated into a much more lethal variety, and now has its epicenter of infection in France. In those three countries, the news about influenza was suppressed by censorship and self-censorship to maintain wartime morale. The news about the virus spread widely when King Alphonse XIII of neutral Spain fell ill. This flu strain became known as Spanish flu, and it was mistakenly thought to have come from that country. It would eventually infect a third of the world's population over the next 18 months, kill an estimated 675,000 Americans, and kill between 50 to 100 million people worldwide. This is the modern-day equivalent of the entire populations of the capital cities of Abu Dhabi, Beijing, Bangkok, Berlin, Brussels, Copenhagen, Lima, Lisbon, London, Madrid, Manila, Moscow, Paris, Riyadh, Seoul, Tokyo, Vienna, Warsaw, and Washington, D.C., all dying from the infection. Globally, more people were killed by the Spanish flu than in the First World War. But initially, you were not unduly worried about this outbreak and the increasing number of people around you getting it. For you had survived it already, and even the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had been violently ill with it, but had gone on to make a full recovery. So you and your co-workers are not worried at the moment. The symptoms at first were much like normal flu, fever, fatigue, muscle and joint pain, headache and lack of appetite, but then often developed into a bacterial pneumonia that caused the lungs to be destroyed and made the patient violently cough up blood. This led the Spanish flu to have a mortality rate which was thought to be as high as 20% of those infected. But then as the death toll starts to rapidly rise and morgues begin to overflow with dead bodies, you start to realize this is more than just your normal, everyday flu. So what's the best way for you to avoid getting this terrible strain of the flu virus? Well, even if you got an earlier version of the flu, it didn't ensure you would not get the latter, much more dangerous one. Hoping the government-imposed quarantine would work, though a good and sensible measure, could not be relied upon as this flu strain spread so fast. By the time its lethal danger was fully recognized, it was far too late and had spread to the four corners of the globe. But if you could avoid public places and limit physical contact with people, this could greatly improve your chances of surviving this pandemic. Washing your hands, especially after you've been out in public, was very important as the flu virus could live on certain surfaces for up to 48 hours and up to 12 hours on clothes. Though bear in mind that everyday soap is of limited effectiveness, as it's good for cleaning dirt away but not necessarily good at sanitizing. Resist dosing yourself with too many painkillers like aspirin, as that could surprisingly save your life too. For at the height of the pandemic, there was a spike in deaths from accidental aspirin overdoses as people didn't know or fully understand the correct dosage, so reading the information on any medicine you're taking is a must. Sadly, a lot of things you could do to help your survival were either not understood in your day and age, or simply weren't available as they would be in the next century. You would think a face mask would help, but to be really effective, you needed to use a certain type that fits around the mouth and neck tightly. The most common cause of death from Spanish flu was from secondary bacterial infection, chiefly pneumonia. In the future, this can be treated highly effectively by antibiotics, 
along with a saline drip to rehydrate you. But this was no option as neither were available to you in 1919 at the height of the pandemic. Also, vaccination against this disease was not an option for you either. Though there had been successful vaccines for smallpox and rabies, vaccines were still in their infancy, and it wasn't until the 1950s that viruses and how to combat them were starting to be really understood. So, if you did become ill, bed rest and drinking lots of fluids were your best way to a full recovery. As for you, you did survive the outbreak and went on to win Academy Awards for animated movies like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day, for you are Walt Elias Disney. <laughs>